All right. So uh, my name is Mike Sweeney. I am a new, relatively new faculty at University of Louisville. And um, I am going to be talking to you guys about fatigue. So um, just off the bat, whether you're affected by a rare immune-mediated neurologic disease or not, how many people in this room have experienced fatigue or deal with fatigue? Yeah. Everybody, right? Um, at some point, everybody deals with fatigue. So my goal today is to try to help define fatigue as it relates to neurologic disease, and then kind of uh, explain or explore how we've studied it or how we try to study fatigue, and then with that, um, try to make some basis for why we use some of the medications we do and uh, what might be helpful for people who uh, have to deal with a lot of fatigue. So what is fatigue? Um, if I asked everyone in this room to give me a definition of fatigue, I would have uh, 150 different answers, um, and they would be quite variable. Um, it's somewhere, it lives somewhere between um, a sense of tiredness to just a physical um, feeling that they just kind of can't go on. Um, it's different than muscle weakness, but it relates to it, uh, and it's different than depression, although it can feel like it. Um, some different studies out there have quoted it as uh, a difficulty in initiation uh, or of or sustaining voluntary activities. That's kind of a very clinical uh, way to say it. Or a subjective lack of physical or mental energy that is perceived by the individual or caregiver uh, to interfere with usual or desired activities. So that leads a lot uh, of room for interpretation, right? Um, it's very common, so fatigue across uh, the whole population, uh, what, you know, healthy people that are surveyed, 20% um, will have some fatigue as it's defined in, in those surveys. Um, and between 10 and 15 million visits to primary care providers uh, each year, um, the primary complaint is fatigue. So it's very common. Yeah, this is me after boards. So. Um, <laughs> Fatigue is way, way more common uh, when, the, when the brain is sick or the spinal cord. Um, I'm going to use multiple sclerosis as an example a lot in this talk, mostly because it's, um, it's been studied a lot in multiple sclerosis. As you can imagine, we have a lot more MS patients than we do TM or NMO or ADEM, so we try to extrapolate a lot of what we know um, for the, a more common disease and try to apply it to uh, r related rare diseases. Um, up to uh, half of people with MS will say that fatigue is actually their most debilitating symptom, uh, which is very surprising to a lot of people when they hear that. Um, it seems to be more prominent um, in inflammatory diseases of the CNS than, it, um, than other CNS diseases. So if you look at, if you compare stroke cohorts and MS patients, uh, MS tends to, for the amount of, accounting for the amount of disability, have more fatigue than stroke patients. So uh, I think we, we use the same uh, PowerPoint strategy, Maureen. Um, so I have a lot of circles and diagrams like this. Uh, so fatigue has uh, a lot of things that play into it. We have uh, the CNS disease that um, we're all here to talk about. We have other systemic inflammatory diseases that sometimes come with those things. So people with one autoimmune disease that affects the brain can have other autoimmune diseases. So people with um, lupus can have a uh, disease that affects the brain and then also can affect spinal cord, it can affect uh, muscles, can affect kidneys. Um, we have a lot of medications. So I, uh, without knowing any of you guys as patients, I, I know for a fact that your medication lists are long. Um, psychiatric disease, so uh, depression um, plays into fatigue, as we learned with uh, the previous talk. Um, hormone dysfunction, so a lot of the things that happen in the brain can affect um, the adrenal access and the hypothalamus and can throw off our hormone levels, and that also affects fatigue. And we have individual patient factors, so we're not all playing on the same playing field. So lots of things to take into consideration. So when we talk about fatigue, we I try to separate it um, into a, per, a peripheral fatigue and a central fatigue. So a peripheral fatigue is like a physical, motor, um, 
problem. It's due to problem uh, dysfunction at the muscle or the neuromuscular junction. It's not directly the weakness that we're talking about, but it's uh, the muscle's not working as uh, efficiently as it should be. And so it, it takes more uh, effort to do kind of the same things previously we're doing before the disease onset. Um, this is more objective. You can measure this with electrophysiology studies. You can uh, test it in clinic um, with sustained muscle contractions, things like that. So this is a more objective thing. Central fatigue is kind of the thing that bothers most people because you know, we can't really define it that well. Um, it's due to dysfunction of the brain and spinal cord. Um, all right. So how do we measure that? Um, there's a lot of things that we take into account. So when you come to see somebody, um, if I see a patient that uh, um, I've been seeing for a while and we're, we're going to sit down and address fatigue, um, we talk a lot about um, what time of day is your fatigue the worst? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Um, is there any relationship to medications? So these are all things you kind of want, as a patient, want to pay attention to and note because they may play a role into how we treat it. Um, look at things that make it worse. So, oh, I, I noticed that in the summertime my fatigue is a lot worse. Uh, is that because of the heat? Is that because your kids are out of school and now you have to deal with them all day? Is that some other reason? There's a lot of things to take into account. Uh, what makes it better? Uh, so are there certain medications that you've been on that do help with your fatigue? Or are there um, other things that you've been doing that may help? And then other symptoms that come along with it. So um, we use a lot of history to guide our uh, assessment. We use laboratory tests and uh, some other ancillary tests to help guide us and convince us that there's nothing else going on. And we'll talk about some of those things. So uh, if there's muscle weakness when we uh, see you, we'll, we'll do, we may do different tests that look for reasons for why you might have muscle weakness other than just fatigue. So I just list some of the possible tests that we look at. Um, so different blood tests uh, and different tests we can do in the clinic to try help narrow things down. Um, do you have droopy eyelids? Are your muscles fatigued? Could you also have uh, other diseases at play like myasthenia gravis that could also be contributing? I have uh, at least two patients who have um, had myelitis in the past and have myasthenia gravis. So things can happen together. It's not common, but there are other things. So we want to always make sure we're pretty thorough. Um, is there a history of chest pain, shortness of breath? Um, are we dealing with cardiac or pulmonary problems? Those are things we need to address. They can definitely make you fatigued. Um, do you have increased heart rate, pallor? Um, we want to address uh, anemia. Are, you, is, are we dealing with a sleepiness problem, not so much a fatigue problem? Are you falling asleep all the time? So we think about getting sleep studies and ruling out sleep pathology. Um, and then we use our exam, and we talk about mood changes. And then um, I think probably everyone that has gone to a, a large center has filled out a number of uh, different kind of surveys when they go there. Um, I'm not sure that everybody knows exactly what they're filling out when they do these things, but um, there's a number of scales, and I just listed them here because there's a wide variety of them. There's a number of scales. Uh, like the fatigue severity score, which we use um, to try to objectify fatigue and try to follow it longitudinally. Um, because if I ask you when you come into clinic, are you fatigued? Yes. Well, how fatigued are you? So fatigued. Uh, and then the next time I see you, is your fatigue any better? Uh, no. But then if I compare your scores and you had a 45 one day and then the next time I see you, it's a 20, we've made a lot of progress. So. Uh, it's something that we use to try to help objectify things, and it also helps us in research. Um, it's kind of the best thing we have uh, to follow people with more subjective complaints. So this is a, a scale where it has um, these nine components, and then you scale on each one uh, a one to seven on how severe they are, and then we, we add them all up and give you, give you a score at the end. Um, there's no specific cutoff value or anything that means you're doing great or not. All right, so what we're all here to talk about fatigue as it relates to um, rare 
immune-mediated neurologic disease. Mostly we're talking about myelitis or diseases of the, uh, that affect the spinal cord. So um, looking back, uh, when polio was still a thing, when Dr. Greenberg was uh, in high school, um, <laughs> you know, uh, fatigue after polio was a, a big thing. And um, there, there's a well-defined post-polio syndrome um, that develops years after polio. And so a lot of what we know about fatigue as it relates to myelitis, we extrapolate from um, that syndrome. We don't know as much about fatigue as it relates to idiopathic transverse myelitis. Uh, we know that it's commonly reported, more than half of kids report um, feeling fatigued after TM. I would say 100% of my patients report uh, fatigue in my adult clinic. Uh, fatigue definitely uh, is thought to play a major role in cognitive function. Dr. Harder has shown us that. Uh, there's no prospective treatment trials out there currently, so uh, we're kind of shooting in the dark in a little bit of ways when we're talking about treatment. And we'll talk about what evidence there is. So uh, can we extrapolate what we know about post-polio and what we're dealing with now? Um, so there's a lot of similarity, similarities to the, the current recently uh, described phenomenon of acute flaccid myelitis, and we talked about that in the small group. Um, but there are a lot of differences as well. So it's not, they're not the same disease. Uh, we're dealing with uh, primarily motor neuron involvement when we're talking about acute flaccid myelitis. Um, we're in uh, a more inflammatory process, like idiopathic transverse myelitis, where we're not just affecting motor neurons, we're affecting um, white matter tracts. So the pathology is different. Um, and there's also in the post-polio syndrome, uh, pain is uh, much more prevalent issue than it is in transverse myelitis. I'm not saying it's not prevalent in transverse myelitis. It's just uh, ex extreme in uh, post-polio patients. And so that may impact the uh, fatigue reporting. Uh, and then in neuromyelitis optica, um, so we're going to talk s about specific things in NMO. So fatigue is more common uh, in patients who have had NMO than in control patients. Um, fatigue scores were lower than those that were reported in MS patients, but not, not by a lot, and I'll, I'll show you some data. Um, and then in, uh, so probably the, the biggest little cohort that was uh, published, there's 22 patients with NMO. Um, and in those 22 patients, uh, they reported uh, a lot of issues with memory. They had uh, decreased information processing speed. There were there was uh, damaged attention, um, and all of those domains that were affected correlated with the fatigue. So all those things are thought to play a role. And then, uh, Dr. Levy, we can talk about some work that you did. Um, so there's a Hopkins study that, or or one of your fellows, I'm not sure. Was it her? It was you. So there's uh, 15 patients with TM, 14 patients with NMO, and 23 with MS, uh, and they kind of compared the, um, the ways that uh, fatigue looked in these patients. This was an older cohort, so patients in their 50s um, on average. The uh, mean duration had been eight years in um, NMO, six in TM, and 10 in MS, so the disease had been going on for a while. So these aren't, aren't patients in the acute stage. Um, Fatigue overall did not differ amongst those groups, so all, the, all of those patients had fatigue. Um, but when you look at who had severe fatigue, so people who scored greater than 37 on that uh, fatigue scale that I showed you, um, the patients with um, MS and TM had a higher uh, percentage reported of severe fatigue. All right, so there'll be a test on this slide at the end. So what causes fatigue in inflammatory disorders? If anybody can uh, really uh, give an answer to that question, they're going to you know, probably earn their PhD. There's, um, there's a lot of work that has looked at it. There's, there's not a single one biomarker I can measure in somebody and say, oh, your fatigue's going to be you know, this. Um, so we think it has to do with circulating uh, pro-inflammatory chemicals, we call those cytokines. Um, 
and they, those lead to uh, propagation of inflammation within the brain and spinal cord. Um, but you know, if these, if these are monophasic diseases, so take transverse myelitis, you have a, uh, an attack on your spinal cord, the inflammation happens, the inflammation's done, why are we still having uh, fatigue 10 years later? So there's a lot more than just circulating uh, inflammatory cytokines or chemicals that are causing you to feel fatigued. Um, there, if you look at that third bullet point, what that means is one part of the brain stops, one, or one part of the spinal cord stops being effective, and another part of the brain or spinal cord has to take over. And it's going to have to do its job, and it's going to have to do the job of uh, whatever it's trying to take over. So you can think of it as trying to work in overtime. There's no way to prove that, but that's kind of a theory of why you might feel more fatigue down the line. And we know there's a lot of other chemical changes that happen in people who have MS, who have NMO, um, as it relates to different neurotransmitters and things. So lots of reasons why you may have fatigue. I can't tell you exactly why. So. Management of fatigue. So this is why we're here, right? Um, the, uh, some patients, when they come to see me and we talk about fatigue, um, they may be a little bit disheartened at first because we don't talk about starting new medications. We don't start about, talk about um, uh, a cure to their fatigue. We talk about things that may be contributing that we can address before we start piling on new things. So we look at their depression. Is their depression being adequately treated? I can say in my patient population, this is the number one contributor to um, their report of fatigue. When we deal with their depression, their anxiety, uh, their fatigue scores improve. They still have fatigue, but it's a lot better, or they're happier about it. Uh, we look at things like B12 levels, we look at anemia, we look at ongoing inflammation, are we sure that we're dealing with uh, an idiopathic transverse myelitis and we don't have some ongoing inf inflammatory things that we can deal with and help uh, speed up recovery process? We look at uh, concurrent illnesses and infections. Uh, for a while there, I thought I was a urologist because we were just treating like urinary tract infection after urinary tract infection. Um, so there's lots of uh, little infections that can be going on that uh, make everything else worse. We look at sleep disorders keep the sleep lab in business. And then uh, we talk about pain, spasticity, muscle spasms, things that are all making your body work harder than it needs to. And then smoking cessation. I'm in Kentucky. I don't know if anyone else is here from Kentucky, but probably it'll be like the last state to have smokers. When the last smoker is there, it'll be in Kentucky. So um, I'm fighting an uphill battle, but that's, you know, we, smoking cessation is a big thing. And then uh, across all problems, uh, this is uh, the biggest point I want to make, is uh, reducing polypharmacy. So we go down the list one by one, cutting off medication, saying, do you need this medication? If so, why, are we, why do you need it? If not, we take it off, OK? So we have to simplify the, the medication list. Um, every medicine interacts with other medicines, and um, none of us are smart enough to know um, how you know someone on 10 medications, they're, they're all going to interact. So we need to simplify that. Other non-pharmacologic uh, points that we can make. So exercise, uh, just like with pain, um, is helpful in fatigue. Now, so how many patients, pa patients how many people here have been uh, to see Dr. Greenberg? OK. OK. Have, has he given you guys the talk about um, limiting the number of steps it takes to get your closet and um, you know, having your quota of energy for the day. Okay, so he has this good analogy about how you have a budget of energy and um, with TM it lowers your budget and now you have a new budget and you have to be kind of um, stingy about how you spend your energy. So that's true for a lot of patients who have had transverse myelitis who are still dealing with a lot of fatigue, but um, it's not true for all patients. So um, sometimes I, when I tell people that analogy, I worry that they're going to stop exercising or stop doing um, aerobic activity, and we're going to get into a place where we're getting out of shape and um, we're reducing our kind of uh, muscle reserve 
So it should be part of your budget. Maybe you, you have to kind of spend a certain amount of your budget on aerobic activity, but it should be um, part of it because it has been shown to be beneficial across the board in all studies that look at fatigue. Um, it's been shown to be beneficial in cancer patients and uh, post-stroke um, and in MS. So we talked about energy conservation techniques and then cooling techniques. Um, not everybody is sensitive to temperature, but in some patients, um, uh, cooling apparatus and things are helpful in that regard. Uh, the point of this slide, um, if you if you are suffering from something as debilitating as fatigue can be, you're going to be desperate for uh, an answer. And uh, um, there are a lot of things out there that are marketing to people who have fatigue. And kind of a new trend is um, kind of these cognitive games or cognitive exercises, and there's a number of them out there. They can be kind of expensive, um, or you can have like to sus subscribe to them. Um, what I want you to be aware of is that these haven't really been tested rigorously in a research type of way. So we don't know if they are beneficial in fatigue or in cognition. So I would just uh, use your best judgment if you're choosing to um, try these things out. They're not going to hurt anything other than your pocketbook. So, so um, before I so. Um, when we're talking about, now we're going to talk about a couple of drugs that we use commonly in patients with fatigue. Um, none of these are on label for treating fatigue in patients with transverse myelitis. So these are all medicines that we're kind of repurposing from other things. And one might, one person may try one of the medicines and say, oh, this worked great, changed my life. And another person may say, worst thing ever, it made me more tired. So. There is no one size fits all. Um, it is a lot of trial and error. We go through a lot of training to try to learn which may be the fat, best fit for what kind of person, but um, when it comes down to it, there's a lot of trial and error. So the first drug I'm gonna talk about is amantadine, which was actually developed as an anti-influenza medicine. Um, it's used widely in the uh, physical medicine rehab um, community. Uh, they like it for post-traumatic brain injury patients. This has been used widely. Um, it's pretty well tolerated. Some side effects may include some dizziness or um, trouble sleeping, some GI upset. Some people get this weird uh, lacy looking rash called levito reticularis um, that's not harmful. It just makes you look um, pale and kind of have this lacy appearance to you. Um, so. I list a couple of different trials, the ones I can, that I could find that were the most pertinent to um, diseases that we're talking about here. So um, the first one is a trial where they compared um, levocarnitine and uh, amantadine. Levocarnitine was actually better tolerated and showed more benefit in that study. So um, you could make the argument that, hey, why don't we try levocarnitine instead? Um, another trial looked at post-polio syndrome-related fatigue, and um, amantadine was no better than placebo. And then uh, in a 115 MS patients who they studied, um, there was a small but significant benefit when compared to placebo. But you should note that the placebo effect was also very high. So, um, and that's true across a lot of these. So just by taking a placebo, people reported their fatigue to be better. So there's, yes, so there's a lot of that in, in all of these research trials. It's not unique to fatigue. We see that across the board in neurology. Um, the aminopyridines I grouped together. So um, these are a family of medicines that uh, block the uh, a potassium channel with the goal of helping to the signals travel faster down nerves. Um, so delfampramine or Ampira is a medicine that is approved for improving walking speed and multiple sclerosis. It is um, difficult to um, get approved sometimes through insurance for other indications, so that's the, the only way to for sure get it approved. But um, it's, it's well tolerated. We don't use it in um, people who have had prior seizures because it lowers your seizure threshold. Um, it can also cause some headache. 
Um, paresthesia is kind of that uh, tingly feeling in your hands and feet. Um, this, so all these compounds are uh, kind of a cousin or similar. They, they metabolize to similar compounds. So uh, 3, 4 diaminopyridine was looked at in uh, multiple sclerosis. In a small cohort, um, it was helpful. Uh, 4 aminopyridine in a larger trial, 54 patients with progressive MS um, didn't show a benefit. So different patient populations, not as helpful. Um, and then when they compared uh, formenopyridine and fluoxetine, or Prozac, uh, on 60 MS patients, there was improvement uh, in both groups on their, um, on their scores. The uh, second to last one, so modafinil and, or armodafinil, these are stimulant types of medicines which uh, work, to, work on the histamine um, and serotonin pathways mostly in the brain. Uh, their exact mechanism is not clear, but um, they're used, they're approved in narcolepsy. Um, so we extrapolate that and tried them in fatigue. Um, different doses have been used. They're pretty well tolerated. Um, so in, in a blind trial in MS, um, after five weeks with a titration up to 400 milligrams, um, there was no improvement in fatigue. Uh, versus placebo. Um, and then uh, a different trial that looked at doses up to 200 milligrams showed an improvement in uh, fatigue uh, after two weeks of treatment. So conflicting results, which is the flavor across all of these trials, because as you can imagine, it's extremely hard to study this, right? And then the last uh, group of medicines are the amphetamines. These have limited use um, there's a lot of side effects associated with these. They're difficult because you have to get a new prescription every month. Um, they can be helpful in some situations. So we do, you know, I do have a handful of patients who take these, but um, we kind of have to keep a close eye on, on that. So um, this is, so this last slide just shows you a kind of common sense uh, flow of how we think about fatigue. Um, Again, so we, we deal with the easy things first. We eliminate or reduce medications. We take away confounding things that are going to be contributing to your fatigue. And then we start to peel away at the more difficult things. So things like depression, we treat that. Are we still dealing with fatigue? Yes. Well, then we look at other things that we can do. So um, just like with pain, it takes... Uh, a lot of work on your part. It takes multiple visits back to the neurologist. Probably, you know, after the first couple visits, we're not usually talking about transverse myelitis anymore. We're talking about fatigue. We're talking about pain. We're talking about all the other things. So I kind of become more of a life coach than I am a neurologist at that point, um, which I'm okay with that. But um, so I put a question slide too because nobody told me, but. Um, <laughs> All right. 